All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to New Life Church, whether you're here in person or online. I'm Jimmy, pastor here in New Life, and I'm really glad y'all are here today. I'm yeah. Glad we have a nice, warm building to be in. And, you know, rumor has it there's some kind of a big sports ball event today, right? So, my question is when you watch like a sporting event, or those of you who don't watch sports, maybe when you're streaming a movie or something, what's your go-to snack? What's your favorite snack? Wings. Wings. Wings? Wings? I like wings, I just can't afford wings anymore. And, <laughs> and you know, just to clear any doubt, as far as I'm concerned, boneless wings are nothing more than glorified chicken nuggets. <laughs> but I, I, do, I do love like a nice hot wing and we used to have an event where we got together with a bunch of guys and ate wings and I always make my hot sauce that was like death sauce, it was so hot. But you know, that's a whole other thing. But this, this week I'm probably going to eat you know, a ham sandwich and watch the game, nothing special. I've, I'm not really big on the game as much as just hanging out with people and watching, you know, celebrating and having fun. But this week, or this year, actually, I even told my boss that because I found out she was working by herself in the kitchen at, at the pizza place. I told her, if you need me, give me a call. Because, you know, I mean, not really even so that I can make some extra cash, but more just to, like, bless my boss and serve her. But anyway, football and all the sporting stuff aside, we're continuing our parable parable series, the parables of Jesus, the stories that he told, and parables, as we've said before, it means basically to set alongside, where Jesus takes something common, something that people know, and sets us alongside something spiritual or that describes the kingdom of God. So a few years ago, I actually was at a pastor's conference, and the speaker encouraged us. He said, if you're not teaching on the parables, you should teach a series on the parables. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's going to be pretty cool. Then it's nice and easy. I got everything laid out. I got all these nice, neat little packages. You know, no problem. Easy, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But, yeah, right. When I look at them, they're so deep. There's so much to glean from them, so much wisdom in them. And I get amazed because in just these short little lessons, there's so much packed into it. And so I pray that God shows us what he wants us to learn from them today. So actually, let's just stop and pray for a second. Lord, we, we come to you with open ears, ready to hear what you have to say, and we ask you to reveal yourself in your word today, and I pray that none of us leave unchanged today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're in another interesting parable. This one is about a rich man and Lazarus. And... This is one of those ones that I, I can't remember really hearing preached very very much when I was growing up or you know newer in church. I don't remember hearing much about this parable. And if I did, it wasn't really it was really kind of softball. You know, like got a few little things, but I think that some preachers avoid this passage of scripture because it deals with some pretty serious issues. And you know me, I don't avoid challenge. I feel like God's word is still speaking to us today. I know that God's word is still speaking, us, speaking to us today. And there's a lot that we can get from it. So Jesus is speaking to the group that's his audience, but he's also, I believe, still speaking to us today. So we're going to dive right into Luke 16. We're in verses 19 through 31. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then come back and share some thoughts and break some things down. So Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because 
I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, in between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place. So that those who... Sorry, I lost my place there. I can't remember not to scroll as I'm reading. A great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to the place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to him. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead comes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the <coughs> prophets, they will not con be convinced in if someone else rises from the dead. So that's a great story. Rich guy goes to hell, poor guy, guy goes to heaven. Okay, that's good. We're done for the week. Have a great week. Go watch football. No. Because I mean, if if I just dropped that at your feet, you'd kind of be like like me reading it and scratching your head. What in the world? And I, and I mean seriously, the first thing you think is rich guy goes to hell, poor guy goes to heaven. And there's so much more to it than that. So we have to start by looking at, like always, at the context. To whom was Jesus speaking? Jesus told this parable. This is still in that whole block of teaching that we've already we've been studying for a while now here in Luke, starting I think chapter fourteen. He's still talking to the Pharisees because he's talking in response to what we talked about previously in verse fourteen last week, where it says that the Pharisees who loved money heard all that Jesus was saying and began sneering at him, or more accurately put, mocking him. They they mocked him for his thoughts on money and for loving the quote-unquote less desirable people. So before we go any further, first of all, Jesus is not giving a message saying, if you're rich, you go to hell. If you're poor, you go to heaven. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, but I want you to make sure we're not looking through those eyes when we're looking into this. So. It starts with two characters. We have two people in this story. First, we have the rich man. What do we know about him? He was dressed in purple. I should have worn purple today, but I forgot. He was dressed in purple, which means he wore the best. He was wearing the color of nobility and royalty. And he was dressed all the way down to fine linen, it says, which basically is a nice way of saying he was wearing fancy undies. Purple was the color of royalty, and it was made from a dye that actually was collected. The people, like the professional people that did dyeing, collected sea, sna sea snails, got a whole bunch of them, and smashed them, and got, as the description says, got their juices, which is basically meaning that purple came from snail guts. And that's how they, they dyed the clothes, was with the guts of snails. And... Fancy undies basically means he was a man of luxury. He didn't do any physical labor. He, he was used to being served, not serving. And he lived in luxury every day, it says. Other translations say he feasted sumptuously every day, meaning he was well-fed. He had gourmet meals. He was never lacking anything. And then we have Lazarus. He was the beggar. First thing that we notice is it says he was laid. Again, understanding the language, it means someone actually took him, brought him, carried him, and put him at this gate. He was laid at this gate. Otherwise, it would have said Lazarus was or Lazarus laid at this gate. But he was, he was laid, meaning somebody brought him. He had to be physically brought and placed in that position where he could beg at, at the rich man's house. Notice he was named in this parable. They said his name was Lazarus, which means God is my help. Lazarus is the only character that Jesus ever gave a, told the name of when he was telling his parables, which means there was significance to it. God is my help. He was somebody 
that relied on God for his help. And this guy longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table, it says. Which, again, a more accurate translation says, he, was desire, he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, that doesn't even really do it justice. Because, again, understanding the people that are listening get this stuff. When it says he was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, basically, back then they didn't have napkins. They didn't use, you know, paper, you know, like fancy barbecue restaurants with paper towels and stuff. They didn't have the linen napkins or anything like that. So what they did, the, the heel of the bread or the, you know, hard crust of bread that they didn't eat, they actually wiped their hands and faces with that to wipe off, like, the gunk or whatever they had on their hands from eating and threw that in the trash. And so it, it, that was what Lazarus was longing for. And now, this just reminds me how well we have it here in this country. I mean, I've been hungry before. I've been real hungry. I've had good <coughs> meals before. But I've never been so hungry that I had to had the desire to dumpster dive to eat a stale piece of bread that somebody wiped their gunky food hands out all over. So. To continue, then, the dogs licked his sores. And I know you're thinking, oh, sweet, puppies, right? Well, not so much. Back then, dogs were not dis domesticated. They were wild, and basically, they were Lazarus' competition for the scraps. Because they, they got kind of first dibs because they were faster. They'd get around, they could get this food. And so, it's not the cute little sweet puppy thing that we think of. It was some competition, but... You know, these dogs even then, when we think, oh, that was nice, they licked his sores. While I did give him some relief, the dogs weren't made, motivated by love and by, you know, for doing nice things. They were basically feeding off of his slow decay. So that gives us, does that give you a little bit different picture on the story now? <clears throat> see it kind of in a little different light? You know, and I, I could see that, the, like in the beginning of the story, the, the Pharisees were probably rooting for this rich guy. You know, because they were all about money. They believed that wealth and power meant there was special favor on them from the Lord. So they, they were rooting for the rich guy, and Jesus just shook their whole world. Because he continues, he says that the, both of them died, Lazarus first, and it doesn't say anything about it. Well, while it says that the rich guy had his burial, he was buried, and, you know, those with money back then had, probably had a funeral. They, it was a sign of earthly status. Lazarus, it just said he died, which means, you know, what happened to his body was what happened to most people who didn't have money for a funeral or didn't have any family. He basically got thrown on a heap, a garbage heap, outside the city, and the dogs feasted on him then, or, you know, the other animals came and got him, or he slowly decayed. But did you notice something here? Well, nobody on earth probably gave a hoot about the death, death of Lazarus. And, you know, his. nobody thought to give it a second thought. Verse 22 says that the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The one that was rejected by the important on earth was escorted to heaven by the heavenly servants. I think that's pretty beautiful in itself. So the Pharisees probably now are starting to get a little uncomfortable. I don't like where this is going. I, I'm not too sure about this because, you know, again, wealth equals special favor in their eyes. The rich man was in Hades, which is basically, it is the place of torment, awaiting for the sentencing, and suddenly he's filled with regret. As I said, the rich man doesn't, being rich doesn't mean you're going to hell. He, the thing is, he lived his life and even as, in his death, as we're going to see soon, as proof that there was no transformation, that he hadn't been changed by the Lord. He was living for himself, full of, you know, and to fill his fleshly desires. Jesus said that man needs to love God above all and use money instead of using God and loving money. That's, that's the point of this. And this is what the Pharisees were doing at the time. And some of us might be doing it today. I don't know. I'm just saying. So even when he cried out to Abraham, Lazarus is, 
in this place of torment, he's suffering. And even when he cried out to Abraham for pity and for mercy, check this out. He still considered himself above Lazarus. He tells Abraham basically, send Lazarus to do my bidding, to serve me, to quench my thirst. He didn't think about the potential effect on Lazarus, that crossing this chasm into Hades could have effect on Lazarus. He just thought, I'm suffering, I don't care what happens to me, just make him relieve my agony. As we see, Abraham denies the request. Once we've left this life, our fate is sealed. It's too late to turn back. There's no change. Verse 26 said, And besides all this, in between us, us and you is a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, and neither can anyone cross over from there to us. By the way, pretty much shoots that whole theory of uh, purgatory out of the water. Once you're there, your fate is sealed. You've had every opportunity in this lifetime to choose the Lord. You're not getting a second chance once you once you grow. So this rich man thinks about his family and his brothers, which is a good, again, it's a good thing. But you can still see the same attitude from from this guy. He says, "Send Lazarus to do my bidding once again." Even after all this, his heart hasn't changed because when he's there, it's too late. You can't change. There's no turning back. But we know this. You know, I mean, he said that you need to see, or they need to see the dead rise so that they'll know. And and Abraham says they have scripture. It's all you need. It's all right there in the scripture. It's a sign. And besides that, we've seen Jesus has raised someone else from the dead, another person named Lazarus. He raised him from the dead. And there was no great coming to the Lord in, in the area where he lived. Jesus himself, as we'll see later, he raised from the dead. He, he sacrificed for us and raised from the dead. And there was little impact in the area. The little impact in Jerusalem and the immediate impact. Obviously, we're here because of this. And we're thankful. And you know, and hopefully we have been transformed because of Jesus. So what's, what... What does this whole story mean to us here in 2022? And, you know, what's our takeaway? So I'm going to answer that kind of by addressing some of the questions or things that I've heard people in the world and even some people in church say before. So first thing I get a lot, I had this discussion a few weeks ago with a co-worker. You know, you know that church is great and everything, but, you know, all I need to do is be a good person. You've heard that one, right? That I gotta be a good person. That's all I meant. <coughs> I'm telling you something. Hell is gonna be full of good people. And I usually, one thing I usually ask somebody when they say that is, "What's good enough? Where's the line?" You know, I mean, to me, it sounds pretty exhausting to make sure that I'm a good person, good enough that I can go to heaven. I mean, do you sit down at the end of the day and? tabulate, you know, have a spreadsheet and, okay, well, I did this many good things. Oh, I really had a kind of a rough day today. I snapped at my boss and I did it, you know, my wife, oh man, I, I'm going to have to do like at least three extra good deeds tomorrow to make up for it. You know, I mean, that's what I picture and, I mean, while I'm joking, I'm somewhat serious. Who determines what is good enough? How much is enough? Romans 3.23 says that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God. Meaning nobody is ever good enough on their own. And that whole making amends, that's a human concept. I mean, when Jesus forgave people, after he healed them, he forgave their sins, he didn't say, okay, now go say three Hail Marys to our Father and do four acts of retribution, and then you'll be good to go. He said, go and sin no more. That's it. All of us falling short of the glory of God means that we're not, it doesn't just mean that we're not good enough. It means we're, we have the sin in us. We're not even allowed in his presence because of that sin. And the first verse that I learned is still the best verse. 
First Bible verse I ever learned, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Meaning our sins are forgiven, and we can be in his presence. The second thing that people say is, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? We've heard that one. I've heard a lot of people say that one. And hell is not a popular topic in, in church today. I believe that's a <clears throat> sad injustice that churches do. Because hell, I'm here to tell you, hell is real. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. You know, the great thinker of our day, Oprah Winfrey, has a spiritual advisor whom I will not name, nor will I name his book. But his book questions the existence of hell. He even goes as far as to say, if, if hell is real, it's not eternal. I can't believe that it would be eternal. And he said something about, you know, like, some, what if somebody, you know, 20 years old had chosen not to follow Jesus, and he ended up in hell. Is he, you know, is he still going to be paying 20 million years later? I'm sorry, it might not be popular. We might not like the answer, but the truth is, if you are not born again, that's what's going to happen. So teachers like that, I say run from them. Run as fast as you can. Do not even read or listen to them or anything. So, first thing we see in the parable, you know, is... There's a, in verse 26, it said there was a chasm between the two. No one can cross. You, once you're there, you can't get to the other side. It's for all eternity. I know it's not what we want to hear, but it's tr <clears throat> true. And as for the whole, you know, there's no hell. This guy is saying, that he says that that's contrary to the Jesus that he knows, the loving God. You know, I'm sorry, but our loving God isn't just some sweet, cuddly cloud buddy. He's still the Lord. I, I, there's such a dangerous a danger. The churches, you know, give this like partial information. I get like as you can tell, it drives me nuts. I can barely even speak sometimes. But you know, there's a danger in the whole. Just ask Jesus to be our personal Savior. Because when, it, when we think about him as our personal Savior, we start to think about him as something that we can mold to our liking, something that we want him to be, when he is still supposed to be our Lord. Yes, he saved you personally. That's great. That's wonderful that he saved you personally. But he is your Lord, or he should be your Lord. There's whole generations that I believe had, have been just not given the whole truth. Because we just ask Jesus into our heart and it stops there. He's in my heart. But it's just this little bitty corner of my heart and I haven't, I haven't had to change because all I was told was I have to ask Jesus into my heart. No, we're told, we, the Bible says we need to submit to him. We need to make him our Lord. Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And again, in context, when you confess with your mouth, that was an oath. That meant something. That your life, your life depended on your word. We were to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and then we'll be saved. You know, back to John 3, verse 3, Jesus told, told the religious leader that was looking for answers he said very truly I say to you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again that's John 3.3 3. now let's be real if hell didn't exist why did Jesus come why did Jesus hang on a cross and die for our sins if hell doesn't exist Jesus in in John 14, the disciple, one of the disciples asked Jesus, what is the way? Show us the way. How do we know how to get to the Father in heaven? Verse 6 said, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's because of his sacrifice that he came and lived and 
pay the penalty of our sins. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is the Lord. So either he was some madman walking around preaching about how he would be the way to heaven, or he's telling lies, or you have to either you have to admit that he is the Lord, that what he said is true. And I believe that it is true. That's why he came. That's why he died for us. Saying that there's no hell voids everything that Jesus did. Because we all have had have sin in our lives. We've all made mistakes. We've all been disobedient to God. And because of that, God sent his son to live a life here on earth. Fully man and fully God. He was tempted by everything that we were tempted by. He faced all the struggles, all the pain, everything that we faced. But he died for our sins because he took on all of our sins on that cross so that when we make him our Lord, we can be saved. We can know that we can avoid hell. And the number one pushback I get from people why would a loving God send anyone to hell? He doesn't send anybody to hell. You have a choice to make. We've all been given a choice to either accept God's free gift of grace, that he paid the penalty for our sins, or to reject it. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All of us, every one of us, like we said in 323, all of us have sinned. All of us deserve hell. But Jesus came to pay that penalty so that we don't have to face the punishment of hell. If we make him our Lord, the penalty has been paid in full. And a lot of y'all might believe in hell. Yeah, you could be like, yeah, I, I get it. I believe in hell. That's why Jesus, that's why I asked Jesus in my heart. That's why I, you know, why I'm here today, because I believe in hell. Do you believe? Do you really grasp the severity? That there's true consequences? It's not enough to be a good person. The, good, the rich man was probably was a good person. He probably obeyed the religious traditions, probably did all the things that made him look like a Christian. He dressed, probably had his best purple suit that he wore uh, to the temple when he would go. He, he probably even gave money in the offering. He observed the traditions of the faith. He observed the feasts. He probably even put money in the collection box. But as we see in the parable, there was no transformation. He didn't, he didn't do anything that showed that he was... Well, well, wait a minute, Jimmy. Wait, wait, wait. What about that whole not by works of righteousness are you saved thing, right? Got you there, right? Good call. But when he transforms us, the residual effect is an outward expression of the inner change. We, our heart changes when we know him, when we're, when we're in his word, when we're studying his word, when we're praying, speaking to him, listening to him. Our actions change, our heart changes. We do different things. I believe if we understood the severity and the consequences of hell, being found without Jesus and without his forgiveness, we'd have a greater sense of urgency because that's just a little tiny description of the torment that the rich man had to deal with when he was in Hades. Just barely anything. And he was suffering. That shows you that we're going to still feel things in the afterlife. Will still feel things. This guy was feeling the pain, the agony. He was feeling this thirst. He wanted just a drop of water on his tongue. This is forever. Eternal judgment forever and punishment forever. So like that rich man, we should be thinking about our brothers and our sisters wanting them to be saved. Have you ever thought about our friends, our loved ones, anyone facing that eternity of judgment and punishment? If you really thought about that and understood, this is for maybe the next 20 million years or whatever, for all of eternity. I mean, 20 million years is it 
It's just an understanding. This is forever that somebody will be facing this eternity of punishment. That should motivate you, motivate us to get busy, to set an example with our lives and our actions and our words. But this is a, a message of hope too. I mean, I don't want to just be all preaching hell, 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 hell. This is a message of hope because in Jesus, just like that, just like Lazarus, who said, God is my, my hope, we can be just like Lazarus and be greeted by the angels and escorted to heaven. Because in Jesus, there's grace. The stuff that, the sins that we have, if we make him our Lord, that's separated as far as the east from the west. And it's available to all of us. As long as I breathe, everything in me will speak reconciliation. We can be with Jesus through all eternity. So if you know him, that's a wonderful thing. What are you doing? Are you going to get busy? Are you going to think about those that don't and the consequences that they're facing? Because it's real. And if you don't know him, today's the day. There are only two faiths when this is all over. And I really do believe we're facing the end of days. When this is all over, there's only two faiths, either heaven or hell. I pray you decide before it's too late. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us today. And Lord, I thank you that in you, we can be reconciled. We can be in your presence. So I pray that we live like that. And I pray that we have an urgency to tell others that there is a way. We can save them from death because you are the way. In Jesus' name, amen.